Hello and uh, welcome to Chris Watkin. We're very happy to have Chris with us today and uh, to be able to talk about his recent book, We Shall Say Figures of Thought. Uh, for those of you that don't already know him, Chris has uh, been working on uh, European thought, French philosophy in particular, uh, for a number of years now, and has written uh, written very extensively, published uh, books, Phenomenology or Deconstruction, Difficult Atheism, French Philosophy Today, New Figures of Thought of the Human, sorry, New Figures of the Human, I'm getting you a little bit book mixed in there, New Figures of the Human, in Badieu, Mayasu, Malibu, Ser and Latour, and of course then most recently Michel Ser, Figures of Thought, which came out with Edinburgh University Press just earlier this year. Um, now, the, this book is, and we'll talk about this a little bit, I think, but um, one of the uh, one of the um, characteristics of Sayer's work is that it's very can be quite challenging to write about. And uh, <laughs> Chris took on the um, the uh, very challenging task of of writing broadly about Sayer's work and providing us with what is, uh, I think, the best broad introduction to Sayre's work that we can, we can find today, which could be covering uh, so many different areas of his, of his writing. Uh, so we're very much uh, indebted to Chris for that, and I'm um, happy to talk to him today about this book. So I'd like to begin, Chris, if I could, by just asking you, what made you want to write this book? Uh, why is it a good idea to write a book about Michel Serre today? Well, David, thank you for, for the opportunity to talk about this wonderful, wonderful author uh, in this interview format. And I know that Serre is someone who you know a lot about as well. So I'm, I'm keen to, to hear some of your own insights as we, as we go along. Um, I first came across Michel Serre when I was doing the, the figures of the human book, you know, what is a human being in, uh, uh, in French philosophy today? And uh, I was coming at him there from the angle of what he calls the great story. So he tells the story of the universe from the Big Bang, uh, and he folds out what you could think of as a narrative identity, but not, not in the, the usual anthropomorphic sense, but in the sense of a, a narrative identity for the whole universe. And um, I was beguiled <laughs> by that idea. The, the idea of de-anthropomorphizing narrative identity. And I, I just thought, you know, I'd read a little bit more about what he wrote casually, as one does, naively. And um, the more I read of him, the more I thought, my goodness, um, why isn't there more about this extraordinary thinker in the English language? Um, his, his thought was distinctive. Uh, you know, he's not microwaved Derrida. He's not rehashed Foucault. This, this, if you don't get from Serre, you won't get those same ideas from anywhere else. You know, he's he's not he's not recycling anything that other people have done. Um, and the the way that 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 he captures a way of being in the world in his writing, uh, and the way that he uses all the writerly tools at his disposal to communicate that. Um, and the, the persistence with which he, he maps it out in territory after territory, I just found increasingly inescapably compelling. Um, and so I, I, I took the decision, it's the first time I've ever done this, and perhaps it'll be the last, I don't know, to write a book on a single figure. Mm. Um, because I, I wanted to try and understand the way that he thought for myself, um, and although there have been lots of treatments of his, his work under particular aspects before, there, there wasn't any overall book length introduction to him, which you know, I, I think was criminal um, because he is such an important and distinctive thinker. And so uh, I ended up, um, for my sins, uh, writing that introduction myself. Mm. And thank you very much for doing it. So we're uh, it's, uh, we we will appreciate it. Um, you just to follow up on that. You you that that that, that sort of uh, leads into the way you structure the book uh, because the the first part of the book is really about how Sarah thinks. Um, could you just could you just tell us a little bit about how you um, 
how you went, how you set about writing that first part, I suppose, and what you what you could kind of draw out from that for the people who are less familiar with sales writing or who have very often um, people will have read some say and I think most people find themselves quite kind of at at sea, if I may use a metaphor that you might <laughs> like. Apt, yeah. um, <laughs> finding it difficult to work out which direction they are sailing, how to get their bearings. Um, so what did you try and what did you try and do with that first part? How did you set about it? Yeah, it is difficult writing a book on a particular author because you you very much, you know, and you'll know this, you very much feel as though you're the servant of two masters, don't you? You're trying to do justice to the thinker in, in her or his own terms. How would they want a book about their writing to be structured? Structured What what cuts with the grain of the way that this person thinks? You know, but you're also writing for the reader who has probably a very different agenda. And, and I was trying to juggle with those two um, responsibilities, I guess, two burdens in, in the way that I was writing the book. So, so the first half, if you like, is the half that, that caters much more to the way that I think Sarah would want to be understood. And it's structured around what what he calls and what I've called after him, a series of um, figures of thought, um, which are really, uh, as far as I can tell, distinctive to Sarah. He, he thinks in terms of figures, not in terms of concepts. And I don't know anyone, Deleuze gets some way towards doing this, but I don't know anyone else who actually does this. Um, and these, these figures, um, they're, uh, well, he lists eight different aspects of them. Um, they're, uh, they're operators, uh, so they're not sort of declarative content, uh, but they, they perform operations, you know, algorithmically, like add one, multiply by four. They, 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 they are operators in that sense. Uh, they're natural, they're present in the natural world, so we're not just talking about intellectual concepts or ideas. In the way that he structures his thought. He, for example, says that species of um, flora and fauna are figures. Um, they all introduce something new into a situation. So if you think about speciation uh, in the natural world, a species is something new, something unheard of. So they're always inventive and creative. Um, they're sustained bodily, not just mentally. So, so he's a very material thinker uh, in that way. And these figures that he thinks in terms of are material. Um, but they're also literary and fictional. So he'll have Ulysses, he'll have Don Juan as figures uh, as well. Um, and uh, many of them are, are personal. Um, so, you know, if you think of, of people like Derrida and Foucault, you've got deconstruction, you've got epistemes, you've got the fold with Deleuze. Figures aren't like that. They're, they're not depersonalized in that way. He'll have Thumbelina uh, or he'll have Ulysses as figures, um, and he will allow these figures to, to unfold for him ways of being in the world, ways of, of thinking, ways of operating upon ideas. Um, and, and, and the final thing I think that's really important for him and for us, if you want to get our head around the way that he thinks, is that these figures for, for Sarah are upstream of concepts. Um, they're not illustrations or examples of concepts. They're actually more fundamental. And, and I think this makes sense. The way that we experience the world is primarily in terms of, uh, of these figures uh, of um, individuals who, who can represent a sort of um, a, a broader uh, whole. Uh, and, and we distill concepts from that. And so concepts are downstream of these figures. And so what I was trying to do in the first half of the book is... Um, to try and discern and sometimes to, to give names to the key figures that he thinks in terms of, because some of them are named, but sometimes there are recurring uh, motifs and operations in his work that he doesn't actually name. Um, and so I was just trying to bring those to the surface and make them visible uh, by giving names uh, to them. And then the second half of the book was more the, the reader facing half. You know, Sarah may think in figures, but we tend to operate in terms of themes. You know, we are experts in the philosophy of language or eco philosophy or the, the philosophy of objects or something like that. And so I, I took three areas and I said, okay, let's think about what Sarah has to say in relation to these three areas. And it, it was um, uh, ecology, 
uh, objects and language. Um, and so helping readers to see that within the, the, the vast sort of web of interconnecting ideas in his works, you, you can draw out insights and interventions into the sort of debates that, that we are used to thinking in terms of, these sort of thematically siloed debates that we think in terms of. There's a lot of material in Sayre, not on the surface, but scattered throughout his work that you can gather together uh, and say something really, really interesting about those debates. That's uh, that's very interesting. It, it opens up a number of um, lines of, um, of thought or questioning that I'd like to, to, to pick up. Um, I'm not quite sure where to go first, but how about how about this? That that just with what you what you said just then to, to end that it that, that says way of thinking because it's not organised around concepts and uh, not organised around those in particular those concepts uh, that we tend to use in order to organise our, our theoretical disciplines and our ways of thinking. Uh, so we can say that we're doing this or we're doing that. Um, the fact that says thinking isn't organised around those concepts, but around the, the figures, which, as you say, put it very nicely, are, are upstream. Uh, does that open up his thinking to questions that academic philosophers or writers or, or, or might might think about, but also perhaps beyond that, because uh, his thinking is not organized around those concepts which form the basis of particular disciplines and particular specialisms and so on. Yeah, he's, he, I mean, he's mm. certainly allergic to disciplinarity, to, to a rigid yeah. disciplinarity. Um, he, uh, he doesn't often get acerbic, he's quite an ironic thinker, and he, he often won't name his opponents, but when he gets most hot under the collar, it's often about this sort of uh, disciplinary beating of the bounds. Um, and uh, he, uh, in his own writing, he's um, very strongly uh, crossing over disciplinary boundaries the whole time, um, you know, to the extent that, that some people have accused him um, as if this were a crime uh, of being a poetic writer. Uh, so he's he's moving out of uh, uh, sort of discourses, third person discourses uh, of um, uh, sort of uh, uh, observing uh, or describing, and then suddenly there'll be a first person anecdote, uh, or there'll be a fragment of a, a, a Greek myth, uh, or there'll be a, a brief discussion of a scientific idea, and um, partly this is because in his way of thinking these things very much are connected with each other, but it's, it's also a refusal to be cloistered uh, in these um, disciplinary and academic boundaries, which, which he sees as just utterly uh, and uh, irredeemably stifling and um, uh, dangerous, actually, because the, the sort of problems that we face today, he says, are problems that can't be solved by any single discipline. Um, you know, if we Think of climate change, for example. Uh, if we think, you know, just in the last year or so, that our collective capacity to respond to a pandemic, you know, it's not an economic problem, it's not a social problem, it's not a philosophical problem, it's not a scientific problem, it's all of these. Uh, and unless we, we come at it with this joined up approach, um, all we're going to do uh, is be so many, uh, you know, little Napoleons fighting for our own empire, saying it's all economic or it's all political or it's all philosophical. And, you know, he would say nonsense. Um, you know, we need we need to draw together uh, the, the, the resources of the different disciplines to deal with what he calls these transversal problems, which are the big problems that we face today. Mm. This, I think, ties in with, with, with a... Um with a point that you make a few times in the, in the book very helpfully and that is and it's to do with the way that Sarah thinks uh, and you 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 say and you illustrate the way in which Sarah doesn't oppose ideas by just arguing against them or negating them or, uh, or something, but by generalizing them um, and that seems to be a really important feature, I think, I think of, of Sarah's work, and, I, and, and, and you pick up on it and, and um, kind of demonstrate its 
his movement through his thinking, if you like, uh, very well in the book. Can you just explain a little bit about what you what you mean by that? So how how does this this kind of opposition through generalization um, work in your view? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you're right. It's it's one of the key moves in his thought, I think. And you you'll know as you, as you write on a particular thinker, there are certain moments where the penny really drops for you. Uh, where you sort of break through the sound barrier and suddenly a whole lot of their thought makes sense in a way that it didn't before. And, you know, for, for those of us who have studied thinkers like, like Derrida and Deleuze, we all know those moments, the moments where things finally seem to cohere somewhat uh, or, or where where we read a page and, and understood half of it for the first time. Yeah, rather than planning not doing that twice um, and and this this was one of those moments for me. This when I I read this passage on opposition by generalization in in his um, early uh, book uh, Le Système de Leibniz, which is still um, unpardonably to be translated uh, into English. Uh, it's 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 his of dramatology. It's his difference and repetition. The fact that it hasn't been translated yet is utterly scandalous. Um, but anyway, yeah, yeah, we hope. <laughs> um, but anyway, in in that in that text, he's got a passage where he talks about the relationship between Descartes and Leibniz. Mm. Um, and um, he sort of begins from the assumption, which I think is the assumption that most people would share, that to oppose something is, is to reject it as incorrect, to say, no, that's, that's not right. That's the way that we oppose things. Um, and uh, he completely turns that on his head. Uh, he says, Descartes tends to think in terms of straight lines one inexorable rational link after another building up this um, uh, this sort of unbreakable chain. Uh, and Leibniz, he says, thinks in terms of webs, finding connections between everything. Uh, now, of course, if, if you look at those two, that there is no opposition. The web is not the opposite of the line. Uh, the web is a collection of very many lines <laughs> interconnecting with each other. And, and so he's got this key phrase in, in Le Système de Leibniz, where he says, Leibniz crowns and completes the Cartesian method in refusing its requisites. And so, okay, so what is what is Leibniz doing there? Is, is he rejecting Descartes or is he embracing Descartes? Well, sort of both. Mm -hmm. He's out Descartes-ing Descartes. You know, Descartes has, has one line, uh, Leibniz has very many lines. Uh, he's bringing Descartes to completion um, in the very moment of rejecting his, his unilinear way uh, of thinking. Um, and so what, what Leibniz is doing with Descartes is he's taking something that's purportedly universal, like Cartesian reason, uh, and he's saying, no, actually, that's, that's not wrong, but it's just one local example of a broader trend, of a broader structure. That's one way of doing it, absolutely. It's not the only way of doing it. So you're moving from the line to the web. Um, and so Leibniz's attitude to Descartes, says, says uh, is that he is opposed to Descartes or generalizes him. Um, the French is, il s'y oppose ou le généralise. And we want to say, well, which is it? Does he generalize him or does he oppose him? And, and the, the, the penny drop moment is when you see how both of those work together, I think. Then you begin to get into Sir's shoes and and to understand the way that he thinks. Um, another great example that he uses is um, Kepler's rejection of Ptolemy's circular model of the heavens in, in favor of conic sections. Um, so it's not that Ptolemy was incorrect. It's not that the circle has to be thrown out. It's that the circle is one very specific yeah. type of conic section. Uh, Ptolemy, yes, but a whole lot more on top of what you're saying. We need to generalize your circles uh, into conic sections uh, and show that, that what you think is the whole is just one local example of a broader paradigm. And that's this idea of opposition by generalization. And then once, once that's there as a structure of thinking in your head, it's all over in Sir. He's doing this again and again and again. It's, it's his signature way of opposing something. Which which ties in also uh, to the, to the um... Uh, one of the points you made earlier on, because what that, what that leads to is is uh, this sense of kind of proliferation of, of continual variations, and so the um, uh, to to follow Sayer's thinking seems to be to to follow him through the elaboration of variations 
uh, of things from one one specific variety, if you like, in that series of general of the generalized uh, series to to another. Um, does that? Um, I wonder if you could, if there's a if there's a connection between that that you could make for us um, and um, another idea which you uh, come back to a few times in the book, and that is the idea of um, global intuition. Mm -hmm. Um, because again, it's 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 an idea. It seems to me that when you, when one thinks of intuition, one tends to think think of intuition as a as a mode of access to something very specific. Um, uh, so the idea of a global intuition um, can be quite a hard idea to get one's head around. I think to begin with. Um, so, <laughs> what uh, what does that what does that what does that mean to you? How did you how did you come to this idea of the global or for yourself, how did you elaborate this idea of the global intuition? What does it, uh, what does it, what does it mean for you? Yeah, oh, it's a fantastic question, really. I mean, it gets us straight to the heart of, of Sarah. I think that if, if someone is coming to Sarah for the first time and wants to try and understand what is distinctive about his thought and what, what it might be able to, to help them with and that the way that they might be able to engage with it, I think figures of thought and global intuition are the two gatekeeper ideas. Um, that that will begin to open up this this amazing landscape of thinking for people. Um, a, a global intuition it, it's a, a term that Sir himself uses um, uh, to describe what he's trying to produce with his writing, um, and it's it it can be approximated to a way of being in the world, a sort of an ethos, a way of inhabiting the world. Um, but but the, the distinctiveness of it, I think, is, is that it encompasses the whole of experience. It's not an intellectual disposition. Or, or it's not a set of concepts, and therefore it's not a worldview, as, as we tend to, to understand that term, which is quite an intellectualized, conceptually heavy way of, of trying to to, to describe how, how someone understands the world. Um, it's, it, it's got some affinities with a Deleuzean image of thought, uh, but again, it's, it's more material, it's more biological than that. Um, uh, another concept that it's, it's got some resonance with is, is um, the idea of the social imaginary in Charles Taylor and other writers. It, it's that sort of idea, but for, for my money, and I, I'm convinced that it's, it's richer, than all of those. And, and I think it's one of the, it says, richest bequests to us as thinkers is to give us this idea of global intuition for us to run with and think about. Um, so it's, it's not only intellectual, uh, it incorporates all of our faculties, all of our sensibilities. Um, and it, it, it is a participation in things um, he, he will talk about the way in which the, the rhythms and patterns of the, the natural world inform this uh, global intuition, but but it doesn't mean that it's monolithic. It doesn't mean that everybody necessarily tends towards uh, asymptotically towards one sort of standard vanilla flavored uh, global intuition. Um, you, you can think of it in terms, for example, of the difference between Sayer himself and Descartes. So, so for Sayer's global intuition, his way of understanding everything that there is and engaging with it and writing about it um, can, I think helpfully be summed up as the idea that everything is interconnected. Um, mm. it, it is possible to move from anywhere to anywhere uh, in terms of, of, of thinking or writing. And indeed, that is precisely what he does uh, yes. in his writing. Um, and that's not gratuitous. That, that, and that's not simply an, an affectation in his writing. He's trying to um, uh, register and participate in something fundamental about reality, about the world from his mm. point of view, which is in fact that everything, despite what modernity has tried to do to it, everything nevertheless is uh, irreducibly interconnected. But, but you can imagine a different global intuition, and, and he does in fact uh, imagine a Cartesian one where one's, one's predisposition towards everything that there is, is, is always to look for how it can be purified, how it can be sundered, how it can be broken down and analyzed um, and dismembered. Uh, and that would be another example of, of this sort of 
global intuition, this, this way of corporeally and, and intellectually, affectively uh, relating to and holding oneself in uh, the world. Um, and uh, it, yeah, I think that there's a huge amount of work to be done. Uh, there are theses to be written, I, I suspect, on this idea of a global intuition uh, and uh, how it can help us uh, to, uh, to, to think through what it means to, to be human and part of a human community in the 21st century, where, where we are increasingly distancing ourselves from this, this sort of arid intellectualism that's sometimes characterized the way that we, we did philosophy in, in previous generations. I'd like to pick up a couple of points about that. Um, the, the, I want, to, in a minute, if I can, talk about um, the uh, uh, the question of of language and, and, in particular, the relationship of language to what what we could call um, the material world. And so, uh, the, the the discussion in said is played out uh, very often in terms of the relationship between atoms and letters and thereafter that kind of relationship of language to um, to the physical world should we say but just before coming to that I want to come back to something what you were just saying there about global intuition and about a way in which it's not just an intellectual um, um, faculty or act and it's it's actually a, a very kind of physical way of being in the material world and it's not something which is specifically uh, kind of human centered therefore it's is you um, that way in which we are kind of embedded in physical world around us. Uh, it took me back to what you said right at the very beginning about one of the reasons you became interested in Sarah it was, is the is a way of thinking about when you when you read his great story, that idea of the history of the universe really, that that uh, this is a, a non-anthropocentric way of understanding our historical position. But with that were those ideas connected for you that that, that actually uh, the idea of that global intuition uh, helps helps to kind of articulate, I suppose, in, in a way, and what's going on with that that idea of a great story, where uh, mm. where the history is told through uh, through successive stages, the right from from uh, paleontological uh, history, geological history, right up to um, to our own. Yeah, absolutely, Ab absolutely, and I think it's just one more example of how for Sarah. That the, the boundaries that we erect are artificial and often strategic and self-serving, uh, rather than, than than reflecting reality. So you know, we divide the human world off from the natural world. We we privilege the human world. We privilege culture over nature. Uh, we talk about progress in those terms. Uh, we privilege that the city over the the countryside has got a great deal to say uh, in a number of works about how we have um, destroyed uh, the countryside. How how Essentially, the whole of France now, he says, crisscrossed by its TGV lines, is, is just an elaborate suburb of Paris. And we've, we've lost the reality of the countryside. Um, and and this, this idea uh, of the uh, some sort of hermetic division between the, the human world and the non-human world, I think, you know, is, is just one other of these self-serving artificial boundaries, you know, how, how on earth as, as embodied beings. Um, uh, who who are parasitic upon the natural world <laughs> with every single breath that we take? Mm. How could we not uh, but be uh, fundamentally tied up with the rhythms uh, and uh, the, the the realities of the natural world? And so, in in our way of relating to the world, it, it, it's surely um, fanciful. Uh, to imagine that we're doing anything else but participating in um, patterns and, and rhythms and... and pre previously, philosophy might have come along and said, well, that's all absolutely true, so it's, it's very important that we philosophise about these things. Um, but that's not what Sarah's doing, is it? Uh, as you said, the difference is, I think, between philosophising about them and coming up with a philosophy of nature and our belonging to nature or our and so on uh, and as you put it just then kind of somehow welcoming these things into thinking which is a, it it yeah. seems that he's he's he has an opening like that or he is trying to uh, conduct 
um, that's perhaps not the right word, um, enact, participate in an opening of that kind into exactly. his thinking. Exactly. Rather, hit than, rather than offer us thoughts about. That is precisely it. It's the difference between mimesis and mythexis. Um, yeah. So the, the way that we do nature philosophy in the most part, um, and this is Sayre's caricature of it, is, is we, we, we sit in our nice air-conditioned office, we look out the window, we see the apple tree, uh, and we, uh, we wax yeah. a little short about, about the beauty of the, yeah. uh, uh, of the wonderful nature out there that, that we're completely cut off from, um, which is uh, a paradigm of, of um, mythexis, uh, sorry, mimesis, we're, we're imitating. Uh, the natural world, but but he he has none of that. He thinks that uh, mimesis is just um, a downstream symptom of a more fundamental mythexis. We, before we've ever looked out of our uh, air-conditioned uh, room window, we're we're participating in the natural world inevitably and wonderfully. Um, and so you're you're absolutely right. His is a a way in which the that what what we call the natural world, and it becomes an increasingly clumsy concept the more you get into Sir, um, because it, it suggests some sort of fundamental distinction with the, with the cultural world, which he denies, is that we, um, we are sometimes intensifying, sometimes reconfiguring, sometimes replaying um, uh, rhythms and patterns that are already there. And so, you know, he will say in texts like Biogia, relatively provocative things if, if you're coming to him, for the first time, like I write like the wind or something like that. And you think, you know, <laughs> what sort of rampant lyricism is this? <laughs> um, but the point that he's making uh, is on the basis of what could you possibly conceive that there's any um, uh, uh, absolute division uh, between the way in which the natural world receives, stores, processes, and emits information uh, and the way uh, that I, uh, as a human being, do now. I, I do it differently, of course. You know, I'm not. He's not saying that uh, the the wind is interchangeable with with my discursive prose. Of course not. Um, but he is saying that there is is no absolute distinction. You know, on on pain of some sort of theological gymnastics. Um, that, that that how on earth can you can you conceive any differently? Um, and so he he has this universal paradigm. Everything receives, stores, processes, and emits information. I do that in my writing. We, we're doing that in our conversation. A, a river bed does that, but also cultural objects, a town, a house do that as well. And, and it's, it's another of these ways of breaking down the, the barriers, which for one reason or another, we've, we've put up between these different um, uh, areas between nature and culture. Uh, between the human and the non-human and saying that, look, we, we need to find ways of thinking across these boundaries, not, not confounding them, not saying that there's absolutely no difference between me and a rock or between me and a stream. Don't, don't take him to be saying that. Um, but that there is a, a fundamental continuity between information processing in these different contexts, which mm. all contributes again to this global intuition. If, if you let that percolate, if you let that seep in to you, you begin to see things, experience things, understand things in, in, in subtly different ways, which I think is one of the great benefits uh, of immersing oneself in Sarah rather than just dipping in and out, that, that he does grow on you, um, mm -hmm. almost like a parasite growing inside. And um, you, you do start seeing things differently, which I guess is a mark of good philosophy, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. It reminds me of what you were saying earlier on about generalization and about therefore thinking through variations. This is the, uh, the, uh, the, my thinking, my writing, your writing, whatever, and uh, how information is exchanged in the natural world are not, um, they're not the same, but neither are they completely and utterly distinct from each other. And therefore, uh, the, the challenge then comes to understand what kinds of variations are are there and what kind of variations are possible, I suppose, and to understand what kind of connections there are, um, as well as, as, as the differences. Which um, I suppose it brings me on to that question about language and, and the idea of and when Sayre talks about, uh, about language and how we, um, 
how we make sense, uh, how we make the transition from what he calls the hard to the soft, from the from the energies out there in the physical world to um, to the to the meaning we have in, in language, the sense that we make. And uh, he's obviously very interested in that, in that transition and uh, comes back to it many times in many different books, and no, most notably perhaps in the five senses is a, is a central theme probably. Uh, and um, it comes back to what you were saying about um, Methexis and not Numesis, about how, trying to understand how sense arises out of the physical world. Now, it's only, as I understand it, my, my kind of take on this is that it's, it's that transition from physical order, should we say, to, to the sense meaning in, in language, sense that we, the sense that we make, if you like, uh, is really possible precisely because of these connections, because of this fact, as you say, that everything receives, stores, transmits information, and therefore we are all, in one way or another, in the same game here. We're all doing, <laughs> we're all doing this. And therefore that makes it possible to consider the connections between the order I see, the physical world, how the physical world is exchanging information from one part to another, and the, the kind of sense that can come from this. Um, do you would you would you think that's the, uh, an appropriate way to understand this transition that he's so interested in? And um, I guess I know you've worked on on on, on other philosophers who have, for whom language is absolutely central. How do you? What is their offering that's different for you at that point, I suppose? Because um, when we think about language or the problem of discourse or, or so on, it's central to a great deal of, of recent contemporary thought. Um, but I, mean, I know you've touched on this, but I'll come back to it. What is it that says offering is that is different here, uh, that takes us in a different direction? Yeah, thank you. Um, it's very very rich set of reflections there. And I, I know that this is um, as well what one of the areas of, one of the many areas of CES thought that, that, that you've also worked on intensely and that, that you have a great deal of wisdom about. So I, I'd be uh, really keen to uh, to hear your own thoughts on this matter. I'll, I'll try and get the ball rolling and then I'll, I'll sort of handball over to you, uh, as we say in Australia. And, uh, uh, a little AFL reference there. Um, and uh, yeah, I'd, I'd love to hear what you have to say as well. So my my sort of understanding of the, the atoms and letters thing, uh, which is is um, uh, there in the Lucretius book, which, which you have wonderfully uh, co-translated uh, uh, recently and done a great service to the academic community in doing, uh, is, is that atoms and letters combine in, in really very similar ways. Uh, they they uh, both they can't combine in just any way whatsoever to create um, molecules or to create meaning. Um, you can't just put a random sequence of letters. Um, uh, you can't just write a random sequence of letters and expect it to be meaningful. You can't just throw atoms together just any old how. There, there, there are certain laws um, that govern their uh, um, combination in both cases. They're, they're both expressions of negentropy. Uh, mm -hmm. Atoms are. are "Quote unquote hard expression, you know, it's a material, uh, directly material expression of negentropy, and um, uh, words uh, and, and sentences are uh, what say we call a soft expression uh, of negentropy uh, to do with with meaning rather than than concrete objects." Um, he thinks of them both in in terms of um, the clinaman inclination uh, and combination. Um, and, and therefore, they're, they're really for him two isomorphic models uh, with a mm. common structure. And, and, you know, he will very happily say that all matter is coded um, and all code is material. Um, it, it just depends. The, the, the difference is the levels of, of, of energy that are required uh, in each case. You need a very, very much lower level of energy uh, in terms of, of uh, uh, linguistic combination. Uh, but you still need some, you know, it's still a natural phenomenon in that sense. Uh, and then when you're talking about the combination of atoms and so forth, you're dealing with much greater um, uh, uh, degrees of energy. Um, but but I'm, I'm really keen to throw this one back to you because I, I think you, you know a lot more about this. You've done this in a lot more detail 
than I have. So what, how, would, how would you think about this relationship? Uh, for say, if I'm allowed, I don't know if I'm allowed to do this, but I'm doing it anyway. So <laughs> forget, sounds between, like you are. Between atoms, like you atoms, are. <laughs> yes. um, between atoms and letters. Uh, yeah, um, thank you for that. Um, the, uh, <laughs> the, uh, I'd, I'd certainly agree with everything you said. That's the first thing. Um, so that's good. And, um, and the, 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 the way in which, um, Seth talks about this in, in for example, the birth of, <coughs> excuse me, the birth of physics when he was talking about Lucretius uh, makes this association very clear uh, between atoms and letters, or at least, as I say, it, it doesn't make it clear. It, it, he, he's, <laughs> he makes it clear that we need to take it seriously, but then what do we do when we take it seriously is, is not, not quite so straightforward. Um, I guess there's, uh, I, I fear I don't have anything like the kind of um, kind of insight into this that you you could have <laughs> just implied. But um, my my view would be a, a couple of things, I suppose. First of all, is that um, as you said, uh, physical work is coded, um, but that doesn't mean that it's simply coded according to language. It doesn't mean that it's already linguistic in some way. And so the, the first thing that comes to mind here in thinking about this connection is that we can, is that there is a, it, there, there is order there and there is, that order can be described as code. Um, uh, and, and if it's code, it can be deciphered. Okay, so, right. So far, so good. That doesn't sound like such a strange idea that the physical world is ordered in ways that we can make sense of. Um, the, the key thing, it, it seems to me, is that, that on the one hand, he's allowing that, this goes back to what you're saying about generalization, that there is no sharp distinction between order in the natural world and the meaning that we can, that we can ascribe to it or just the meanings that we can elaborate in other ways. Um, and that means that we, he, that helps him to cut across this, this problem between realism and idealism and, and how are we going to understand this connection between, between conceptual order and the, and, the, and the material world, which uh, doesn't appear to have anything intrinsic to do with concepts because they're just out there and concepts are ours and so oh, it breaks down all of those kinds of problems and finds a way th finds a way through them um helps to helps to find a way through them and it means you've got a connection between order as we can um, be in touch with it uh, in the natural world and the sense that we make of it without assuming therefore that language structures that experience completely so it allows that two-way communication, which you've been speaking about, which I think is um, important. And the other, the other thing that seems important about it uh, to me is, and it goes back to what, again, you were saying a little bit earlier on and touched on it just now about kind of patterns of thinking and figures of thinking. And that it's not that, that we can um, just kind of somehow lay ourselves open to the experience of the natural world and think we automatically know what it means um, and thinks that it's speaking to us and we can go away and write it down and go, that's it. I've, I've, uh, the trees have been speaking to me. I know what they're saying. Exactly. Uh, it's rather, rather that there are patterns, there are ways in which sense occurs, there are ways in which order emerges, there are ways in which order transforms itself and those uh, the, the kind of order or disorder into which it comes into contact. And so we can look at that and we can understand how those operations occur, how those transitions occur, how those variations are uh, elaborated. And um, they can become part of our thinking. They can become part of our writing. So, they can, so we can, in that sense, think in ways which are consonant with, uh, rather than simply draw, assuming that we can draw the meaning from something. Um, and that, uh, that seems to me uh, perhaps 
for me at least, that's perhaps the most important, most important thing about how that connection works. Yeah, no, I, I absolutely, I, I think you've, um, yeah, you've, you've brought the conversation around to something that I think is incredibly important there, and that that really sets Sarah apart from the other thinkers of language um, uh, in in his generation, um, which, which is is this idea that you were you were talking about just now about emergence. Uh, Sarah is is very. Um, uh, assiduous in his plumbing of how language emerges from what he in some places calls the tohu bohu uh, of uh, reality, this sort of incipient rhythmed existence. You know, we might think of the, the heartbeat or the, 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 the rustle of the wind in the trees or the, the lapping of the oceans, these incipient rhythms in nature um, that almost tease meaning that tease syntax at a certain point and then sort of build into you know bird song or whatever um and and there, there are so many figures in says writing for for this liminality of meaningfulness you know he talks about noise a great deal genesis he's got a book on music where he's doing a lot of this and that's probably one of the the things that sets him apart that that language doesn't just parachute down from for say, from some topos uranios as some sort of human artifact. And, and therefore syntactic human language is not the paradigm of meaningfulness for him. Um, again, it's 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 it deeply embedded in the natural world. Um, and it emerges gradually out of this this tohu bohu, these these little pre-musical rhythms of the natural world. Um, and, and therefore is in continuity with those, even though it is a much more intense expression of meaningfulness, you know, than the wind rustling in the trees, for example. Again, he, he, we mustn't caricature Sir uh, and think that he's saying that me speaking these words to you and the wind rustling in the trees are interchangeable with each other. We, we, we mustn't um, uh, uh, simplify him in that way. Um, but, but he is suggesting something important about the way that the language that we use is not the zero degree paradigm of all meaningfulness um, against which anything else must be metaphorical if we, if we call it meaningful. You know, so if we say uh, uh, the, the, the riverbed writes or the riverbed speaks, you know, our, our natural inclination, I think, because we have been brought up with, with these, these unbridgeable dichotomies between the human and the natural world is to think, oh, that's a very nice metaphor. That's a very romantic way of thinking. And say wants to, to push back on that and challenge us uh, and say that that may be convenient and strategic for you as humans because it keeps for you this, this privileged place in the natural order where you are the measure of everything. You know, you have language and anything else that quote unquote speaks, speaks metaphorically in relation to you. But he would say that's just not true. Um, it's it's a, that you're borrowing ways of speaking from the riverbed at that point. I mean, it's that your writing can be, <laughs> you know, it's, it can go both ways. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. You know, we, we need to stop thinking uh, of ourselves uh, as the exception to every rule um, that everything else obeys in the natural world. Um, yes. And you know, there, there are immediate political stakes there. This is not just a, a sort of abstruse philosophical point. Um, or a sort of a, a, a quaint poetic way of, of, you know, some sort of reheated romanticism. You know, there, there's an ecological crisis that we're facing, uh, and it is in no small part due to us seeing ourselves as the exception to every rule. Uh, and yes. therefore, in order to address that, you know, we don't just need a different energy policy. We, we, we do, in many ways, need a different global intuition. And how do you do that? You know, you don't do it through legislation. Uh, you do it through through much subtler cultural transformation. And, and I think Sarah, in, in part of what he's doing in his writing, uh, is showing us something of what that can, one way that that can look. Um, mm. and, and so that's just, just to sort of round off that thought, you know, there's there's one line of criticism of Sarah that, that, that he is apolitical or that, that he is scared of, of politics. And I just think that's, that fundamentally misunderstands the political stakes of what he's doing uh, and the, 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 the immediate um, sort of implications uh, for the way in which we are able to live in this world for another few hundred years of mm. the sort of moves that he's making. I think it's quite naive to say he's apolitical. Mm. 
would it be would it be um, would it be wrong to say that there's a, that there's a kind of um, extended politics in this thinking in the sense that it's a, the, just bearing in mind what he says about the uh, about the relationship between nature and the social and the exclusion of nature from the social contract and we have to welcome nature into a, with a new kind of contract a natural contract um, that immediately puts politics in connection with nature in a new way and so the, the idea that he's that he's not political sometimes I wonder if that's uh, a charge which is laid against him because he's not doing politics in the way that he politics has been done in effect and that's uh, in that um, that concern with the with the political as, as it's kind of defined by this by the human life and it's and it's the human community uh, just, it's actually there's a there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a, a whole collection of bigger questions which you're which he's engaging with certainly yeah and just to sort of put some flesh on those those Bones, I think that the reason that he doesn't want to do politics in the way that it's usually done is, is that our, our politics, I think, from his point of view, is, is irrevocably Cartesian. It's always looking to divide and to purify. It's, it's looking to distinguish and draw um, uh, uh, divisions. You know, we look at the political scene at the moment in any number of countries with which we'll be somewhat familiar. And I, I think we can see the both that happening and the the dangers that that brings with it this this analytical politics that is always divided um and of course that is inimical ever since his leibniz book to, to everything about the way that he thinks the world is and the way that he wants to think so you got to do politics differently it's got to be a politics of federation uh, of drawing links uh, lest he were to to renounce his his whole global intuition at the moment he becomes political and therefore it won't look like the politics we're used to that doesn't mean it's not political. Uh, it, it, one thing that it means is that the politics that we're used to is perhaps part of the problem. Mm. Very interesting. Yes, that might bring us nicely onto um, to uh, the topic of what you're working on at the moment or next, because I understand you're you're really looking to to work on questions very much connected with this uh, on, on the questions of. Um, Natural contract, nature, what kind of contract we establish with ourselves and the world around us. Um, I wondered if you'd like to share a couple of thoughts, further thoughts about that uh, and, about, and the work you're doing before we uh, before we round off today. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I've um, uh, I've been uh, given the, the the responsibility and the the privilege of um, a four year research fellowship in which I'm um, tasked to look at the the social contract. Um, uh, and uh, where we are in relation to it today, um, how it gets broken, how we can fix it, um, and uh, ways in which we can use contract language to to address some of the problems that we're uh, we're facing today. And obviously, one one of the huge um, uh, areas that that we desperately need to address uh, as a society and as individuals is is the climate crisis. And therefore, says natural contract looms large. Uh, in this project as a way of trying to, to use a concept that we're familiar with. I think it, it's like time, isn't it? Everybody knows what the social contract is until the point where you're asked to define it and then it gets incredibly complex incredibly quickly. But we, we sort of got an intuitive sense and in, in, the, you know, in the broader public, there's an intuitive sense of what the social contract is and what it looks like when it breaks down. You know, you look at the recent Black Lives Matter protests, people know when it's not working. And so we, we've got this concept that, that has traction, that people understand. Um, and how might that then be used to, to reframe um, uh, ecological debates that, that people do find it often hard to, to get a handle on? Uh, you know, if we, we're projecting 50, 100 years into the future, that's um, existentially hard. I think for a lot of people, you know, us to, to, to do that with a sense of immediacy. Uh, and so using this contract language as a way to think about our relationship with the natural world, um, uh, which, is, which is exactly what said us in the natural contract uh, and elsewhere, uh, could, be, could be one way to, to try and um, uh, bring these, these ecological concerns within uh, an ambit that we 
feel comfortable and empowered to act in. And you can see, for example, you know, we, if, we, if we're breaking uh, our contract with the natural world, uh, then, then that, that idea has traction again. It, it, one, can, one can understand and feel the, the, the weight and the need to remediate something like that. And service is just incredibly helpful for us in uh, understanding what it would mean to have, what it does mean to have a contract with the natural world. You know, we, we're not assuming that, that nature picks up the pen and, and signs on the dotted line. And so very helpfully uh, in the natural contract says, well, that's not how the social contract works otherwise. A anyway, uh, and yet we, we have this very serviceable idea of a social contract that nobody ever signed, apart from the case of constitutions, which is a very special case yeah. and ev even they that anyone living now has not signed our constitution um and so what it means to be in a relationship of, of contract and and he uses an image of uh, ropes mountaineers tied together with ropes uh, and that, that something that happens to one of them will necessarily impact on the others and he sees contract in those terms so it's not a written document it's a, it's a co-implication it's a you know to use language that's quite popular at the moment, it's a we're in this togetherness uh, and, a, and a recognition of that uh, in that, you know, if things happen to the natural world, things happen to us as well. And we just we just can't get away from that. We are contracted together in that way. And It's a connection. It's, it's a connection. You can sustain a very, and to go back to the kind of uh, language of atomism and so on, it's a connection where something has come together form the combination and the, but that combination then has a has a particular character to it I mean, it's not just the two things are combined but they have to be combined in particular ways which then which then adds certain kind of constraints to them and certainly adds certain kind of characteristics to their relationship and their possibilities and so on and so on i suppose so it's it's yeah it's about trying to think well that connection which takes takes us back also to the themes of um of language in the material world and, and and so on about our senses and uh, and, uh, and everything else so it's, it's it's there in in those in those relations i guess uh, between between ourselves and, and the and the physical world around us through our through our senses first of all that that um that question of human exceptionalism really starts to get played out I suppose because that's the that's the point in which we are inevitably connected to the material world and then if you if you wish to introduce a notion of human acceptance you have to turn your back on that and think in some other way which of course is in some respects what has what has happened and so the uh, the reversal of that acceptance also then takes you back to this point of us being connected embedded communicating uh, with with the physical world the whole time completely and and bound to it by very determinate terms you know so this contract yep. is not some sort of ineffable fanciful sort of imagination you know you try and throw yourself out of a 10th floor window or burn the whole amazon down you you will soon find out that there are very strict terms to this contract that there are certain laws that the natural world will enforce <laughs> and that we cannot break Indeed, yes, indeed. Um, what, just to perhaps I could just uh, finish with one um, one question, which is uh, this is a simple question, but it's probably really difficult to answer. So I'm sorry about this. But for somebody who's not really read a great deal of, of Sayers' work, where where should they begin? <laughs> Where's a good place to start? Um, okay, the 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 easy and evasive answer is that I do have a blog post about this. Uh, it's called something like, where should I start with Michelle Serra? Um, but if you go to christopherwatkin.com and, and Google and then find, try and find posts on Michelle Serra, um, you'll, you'll find it. But that's, that's, that's not adequate, is it? I can't get away with that. Um, so let me, let me say that it depends what you want to get out of him and it depends where you're coming from. It, for philosophers, um, if you've got a stomach for recent European philosophy and you're comfortable with, or relatively comfortable with, you know, Foucault, Derrida, Deleuze, people like that, I would just dive in with a parasite. Um, read it slowly, uh, uh, try and pick up the allusions in it. 
Um, it's just incredibly philosophically rich. The whole paras paradigm of parasitism as an ontology and an ethics and a politics, I think is a great place to, to dive in with Sarah. Um, someone without a philosophical background, um, he's, he's written some really interesting um, bestsellers. Um, the, his book translated into English as Thumbelina about te technology and millennials uh, is, is a nice, relatively setting the bar low entry uh, into his thought. He, he wrote an interesting book on the financial crisis in 2008. Um, and if, if you want to be serious about Sir, so if, if you're, a, say, a doctoral student who's wanting to use him uh, in your thesis, or if you're a scholar who, who's, you know, you've read a little bit of Sir and you think, okay, this, I want to, uh, I want to do Sir properly, um, you, you cannot avoid the Leibniz book, Le Système de Leibniz, um, all 700 pages of it. Um, but it is, uh, it, it is a gold mine of Cersean thinking. It's also very early Cer, so you can see how his thinking's developing and you can, you can see the, the pieces being put in place that he will then later move around in different ways. Um, and just finally, if you're coming at it from uh, the point of view of uh, ecology, then the natural contracts, absolutely. But malfeasance is really, really interesting. The book translated into English is malfeasance, uh, which is about pollution in a very, very broad sense. Um, and uh, a, a book that I don't think has been translated yet, though it might be La Guerre Mondiale, um, the, the, literally translated as a world war, is another great uh, piece for, for eco uh, philosophers. Um, so it largely depends what your um cup of tea is uh, but yeah those those are some thoughts thank you uh, it's an illustration of the fact that um uh, we've been speaking for around about an hour and have barely scratched the surface of one small part of, of what we could have been talking about um and um so much of which is uh covered in in your in your book uh, which i obviously just encourage people to read uh reading sarah i you've given a, a very helpful outline of places to begin i think um uh, for many people your book will be a great place to begin just to, to help uh help in making sense and giving some orientation uh, which can be a difficult thing as we said earlier on it's uh, but so it's been great talking to you uh chris about this and thank you thank you very much david it's been an absolute pleasure thank you so much uh for indulging me uh, on this subject my pleasure <laughs>